Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, music lovers and audiophiles. This video covers our 2024 product of the year, the Bach for Mac Intro and Audiophile Editions. I hope you enjoy it. Let's start with a quick summary. In my review of the Theoretica Applied Physics Bach for Mac Stereo Purifier, I gave a basic rundown on why I think Bach is a breakthrough in stereo presentation of the type that comes along perhaps once every couple of decades. That, in a nutshell, is why we're awarding Bach as our 2024 product of the year. If you're an audiophile, we also think you will want to know about this and how it works. As a result, this coverage is much more extensive than has been typical for our recommended products awards. The version of Bach for Mac software that I tested previously, called Bach Audiophile Edition, costs $5,060 plus the cost of any Mac M2 that you might need to run the software. There's a simpler version of Bach for Mac called the Intro Edition. The Intro Edition is priced at $980 of course, you also need a Mac. And many viewers of my earlier video wanted some coverage of this version. We are awarding the product of the year to both versions since the intro edition is easily upgradable and they're envisioned as related products. We got hundreds of comments on the earlier Bach coverage, which has helped me learn some of what makes Bach processing difficult to understand. So after I describe UBAC, the processing offered by the intro edition, I will cover some of the gaps I discovered in my prior explanation of Bach and the technological concepts here. I think you're missing out on a big thing if you don't experience Bach, and it appears that many people might dismiss it for what I think are unnecessary reasons, so I hope to address those issues. The goal of Bach processing is to present a more meaningfully accurate rendition of stereo signals. The UBAC version, which I cover initially in this video, uses a universal Bach filter for processing stereo. It is universal in the sense that it uses an average head-related transfer function rather than measuring your specific HRTF. I will explain what this means in a bit, but for now it's simply an uncustomized version of Bach that you get in the intro edition. As Theoretica suggests, I found that using my specific HRTF enhanced the results of Bach, but I also found that UBAC makes a significant and beneficial difference in the spatial properties of stereo. As such, I think UBAC could serve as a solid and relatively low cost introduction to Bach processing for those unwilling to take the $5,000 to $8,000 leap straight into the full deal with Bach. Since the full version of this video will be long, I want to summarize the spatial impact of UBAC for those without the time to watch this whole thing. One way to summarize is to say that UBAC does four things. One, UBAC gets the musician positioning off of or out of the speakers, creating a more natural sense of the stereo images. Two, with many recordings, UBAC opens up the soundstage to a small but meaningful degree particularly giving the sense that performers are on a stage slightly wider than the typical plus or minus 30 degrees of conventional stereo. Three, UBAC opens up the sense of air or three-dimensionality for each performer so that performers are better spotlit and musical lines are easier to follow. And four, UBAC creates a better sense of the acoustics of the performance venue, rendering real or virtual hall or club reflections, which come from the sides and the rear more completely and naturally. UBAC does these things with standard stereo recordings. Bach Audiophile Edition processing does what UBAC does, but to a greater degree. That means Bach works with essentially all stereo recordings from 1958 on. Now, if those don't sound like valuable qualities, this is probably the time to move on. But if they do sound valuable, yet you're skeptical that they can be delivered better than in conventional stereo, you may want to watch further. Because I'll attempt to explain why the signal you're currently listening to is messed up, 
and why Bach addresses that through distortion reduction, not arbitrary tricks. Let's discuss the impact of Bach processing. One problem I have seen with Bach explanations and Bach demos is that I and others have a tendency to talk about what we might call demo mode. Demo mode is the use of unusual recordings that show the extremes of what Bach processing can do. For example, on Pink Floyd's album Uma Guma, there's a track called Grant Chester Meadows. One of the performers on this track is a common housefly. Yeah, you know, the thing you want to swat in the summer. The insect on this track moves around the room when Bach processing is applied. The impressive thing in a way is that the insect buzzes over to your side and to the left rear, and then the fly can be heard from directly behind you. Regular stereo simply doesn't do this with anything like this positioning range for reasons we'll touch on later. But with Bach, there are plenty of examples of being able to present an image in a much broader spatial domain than with standard stereo. That said, when it comes to musicians performing on a conventional stage in front of you, this ability as described from demo mode sounds odd and kind of pointless or weird. Because it would be kind of pointless if Bach's benefits were about presenting musicians from behind you or some party trick like that. Fortunately, this 360 degree arc that I'm describing, or less with you, Bach, but broader than normal. Anyway, this positioning that's possible for the direct sound from the performers is not what Bach excitement is about. Bach doesn't generally reposition the performers in a dramatic way, if at all. Where the larger horizontal and to some degree vertical arc of the imaging space is valuable is when it comes to presenting the performing space. If you've ever been to a live orchestral concert in a proper performance hall, you'll know what I mean. The wave front of brass or drums or cellos goes out to the listeners and then goes beyond and reverberates back. In a good hall, the reverb time is maybe two seconds and your ear and brain are designed through evolution to detect that this is a reflection. It is part of your sensing and sizing of the environment. This sense of space is valuable for rock and jazz and all sorts of music. I simply use the classical example because the performance environment is very well characterized. For example, the reverb time of Symphony Hall in Boston is 1.9 seconds. So, with classical, it's easier to be specific about these things. I should also say, and I'll say more later, that this sense of space applies to studio recordings as well, though then Bach is less about literally recreating the absolute sound and more about not muddling the engineer simulation of a natural performance environment. With standard stereo, the reverb is more compacted into the area between the speakers. This isn't natural if you think about it, and whether you think about it or not, you know it isn't quite right when listening. Bach locates the reverb much more naturally, and here's the kicker, that naturalness helps at least some listeners get closer to a suspension of disbelief about the reality of stereo. Not to go all woo-woo on you, but a greater suspension of disbelief or a greater sense that the music sounds real is at least more relaxing, and at best, it gives the listener a much enhanced involvement with the music. The ability of Bach to open up the soundstage also has value with regard to the presentation of performers. Again, this isn't at all about the ability to place performers in various odd locations around the room, although this is indeed possible with Bach if the engineers either wanted it or possibly if they screwed up. It also isn't really about placing the performers precisely. Rather, the lower spatial distortion of Bach, more about what that means in a bit, the performers are more distinctly presented. As I said in the original Bach review, it is as if each performer gets his or her own amp and speaker channel, by which I mean that the resolution of each performer seems to go up significantly. This isn't a spectral thing, like brighter treble, for example. It's the sense that the performer is presented in a less muddled way. 
There is research showing that if performers are placed more distinctly on a larger virtual stage, the ear brain hears more of the detail in the recording. That indeed is what I hear with Bach. If you've listened to a $1,000 amp and then compared it to a $50,000 amp, you probably heard something like this, at least if the ancillary gear had the necessary resolving power. Comparing the U-Bach of the intro edition to the C-Bach of the audiophile edition, C-Bach stands for custom Bach, with custom, head-related transfer function, and live head tracking, a simple explanation is that U-Bach is perhaps one-third or one-half the way from standard stereo to stereo with full Bach spatial distortion reduction. By that I mean, U-Bach opens up the sound stage from the speakers more than with standard stereo, but less than the full Bach implementation. U-Bach presents more venue reverb in the relevant places than standard stereo, but unpacks less of the reverb and puts it less naturally around you than Bach Audiophile Edition. U-Bach delivers greater resolving power for each performer than standard stereo, but less than with fully customized Bach. While I think fully customized Bach is wonderful, there is one area besides price where U-Bach might be better in the minds of some listeners. U-Bach is less likely to present musicians from odd rearward locations. This, in my experience, is an issue mainly with older recordings, especially from the very early stereo era of 1958 to 1962, let's say, where I believe the engineers had just not refined their techniques as much as they did later. And note that you can run the U-Bach filter or various C-Bach filters at the touch of a button with Bach Audiophile if you find certain recordings that need to be dialed back spatially to something more like standard stereo. Speaking of standard stereo, I also think U-Bach might be a preferred bridge from standard stereo with no crosstalk cancellation to so-called full C-Bach crosstalk cancellation because U-Bach sounds a bit more familiar while also being distinctly better than standard stereo. I believe there are a few downsides to U-Bach that I didn't hear with custom Bach Audiophile. With Bach Audiophile, the frequency balance seems impressively similar, which is like, I'm pretty much saying identical to what I hear without Bach processing. With U-Bach, there's a bigger difference from normal. This isn't very big, but it's noticeable. Theoretica says that the processing in both versions is flat, but I believe the difference in HRTF correction may be what I'm hearing. The other possible issue with UBAC is that your results may be somewhat more dependent on the quality of your room treatment and your equipment. The simple way to say that is if, the, if you have a less treated room, UBAC may not do some of what I described earlier. I have a moderately treated room, you can see some of it. I've got 31 traps, absorbers, and diffusers in my room, and it's got fairly clean impulse response. These treatments benefit standard stereo, UBAC, and Bach audiophile, but Theoretica says that UBAC may be a bit more sensitive to treatment as well as to equipment phase accuracy. Of course, I should add two things. One is that $980 to test drive what may be the largest shift in sound reproduction accuracy in the past two decades seems pretty modest. You have 14 days to try it, so your risk is really only time, not money. If you like UBAC and want more, you pay the difference in price for the audiophile edition and you're ready to go further. If you don't like that, the restocking fee for the audiophile edition hardware is minor. The other thing to mention is that you have a modest stereo. If you have a modest stereo, you may find investing in better equipment to be more valuable. That's not a given in my book, but it might easily be the case that better speakers or a better DAC would be more beneficial for where your current stereo is. My original guess was that above about a $10,000 system, Bach becomes the highest value per dollar item that you can add. But that's just really to give you a starting point for thinking about this. You have to decide what you value and you know your system and what bugs you about it. Now let's talk about how Bach is set up because it just helps to understand how you would integrate it in your system and 
you know, how much it sort of takes over the world or doesn't. I'll describe my setup because I think it's what many users would do, plus or minus a little bit. And this will help you comprehend the signal path. I have an Ethernet cable run from my modem into a Mac Mini. I have Rune on my M2 Mac Mini, which streams Cobuzz and Tidal from the cloud. On the same Mac Mini, I have Bach fed by the streams that Rune Remote requests from Rune and Cobuzz or Tidal, depending on which recording I'm listening to. My UBOC filter is programmed with the distance from my ears to each speaker and the distance between the speakers. That's just something you measure with a tape measure and enter into the program. My Mac Mini then feeds my DCS Lena DAC via USB. The Lena goes to my Audio Research Ref6 preamp. The Ref6 preamp goes to my PS Audio BHK600 mono amps. The PS Audio amps drive my Magico A5 speakers. And there you have it. So, in this particular case, I've got my streamer on a Mac that also has Bach for Mac on it. Assuming your streamer has USB output, I believe you could re replace my Rune on Mac setup with either a Rune Nucleus or some other streamer. This would go via USB into the Mac Mini where Bach lives. The rest of the setup would be the same. You can use analog with Bach, however, an A to D conversion is required. I kept my analog going straight into my preamp because of the touchiness around digit digitizing analog that constrains reviewers. You aren't really subject to that, although you may impose that constraint on yourself. You can use CDs with Bach. You can use files on disk. Let's talk about some of the objections that people raise to the idea of Bach. As I said at the outset, I learned that there are some objections to Bach on the part of some viewers. I think most of these are the result of misunderstandings, which I assume were either my fault or items that I didn't address at all. I'll take another crack at this in the hopes that those of you who are interested in Bach but skeptical get the information that you need. We're going to go pretty deep into the weeds, so you may want to sign off here or come back to the text version on the web to more easily check out the FAQ that you're most concerned with. First up, an objection raised was, don't recordings have to be specifically encoded to use Bach processing? I put this one first because it seems to underpin a general feeling about a problem with Bach. So let's start with this. In a very important sense, all stereo recordings are already specifically encoded to use Bach processing. You may think, what? Bach processing is new and stereo recordings have been around since 1958. That's impossible. To understand, it helps to see that Bach processing is simply removing a distortion that's present because of the structure of stereo playback as we've been practicing it for about 65 years. Stereo in your home adds signals from the right speaker that make their way into your left ear and from the left speaker into your right ear that shouldn't be there because those signals aren't on the original recording and weren't in the performance space for you to hear if you had been there when the recording was done, if the recording had been done live. These additional signals constitute a distortion that is always added by any stereo without crosstalk cancellation due to design of stereo recording and its related playback chain. The big conceptual point is that this distortion is present because of the fundamental design of the stereo architecture, so we know it is there. Blumline, the inventor of stereo, knew about it, and Bob Carver knew about it, so he created his sonic holography circuit, and Arnold Clayman of Hughes knew about it, and so he designed SRS, and Polk knew about it, and built a stereo dimensional array into loudspeakers and still does. The point of this brief history is that the problem being addressed by Bach is well known. The difficulty is that while the microphones are encoding the signal we want, the playback system is adding a distortion that we don't want. So the encoding has happened, we're just messing it up later on and then failing to correct 
this added spatial distortion. Take a look at my original sketches to see that the signal you're adding when you play back stereo recordings in any in-home equipment that doesn't have crosstalk cancellation is not intended to be there. We're going to consider just your left ear, but the right side is similar. You just swap the terms around. What your left ear hears in a imaginary simple concert is something I'm going to call L plus R mod H. That's the left signal plus the signal from the right side modified by your head dimensions and shape. Now, what the left mic hears when it's making a recording of the same thing that we just talked about, we'll get to how this is done in studio recordings later, but hang with me, is L plus R mod M. That's the left signal plus the right signal modified by mic position, direction, and microphone polar response. Now, this is where you really have to think a little bit. The important thing to note is that the mics pick up a similar signal to what your ear picks up. It isn't the same, but it's similar. Now, here is what your left ear hears from your stereo. L plus R mod M plus R mod H plus L mod M. If you can focus on that equation for a minute, you'll notice that the last two terms, R mod H and L mod M, are not part of what the left mic heard. Those two terms, R mod H and L mod M, are the interaural crosstalk signals that I'm calling spatial distortion because they don't sound like harmonic or intermodulation distortion, they sound like altered and muddled spatial positioning and sizing. Your ear hears these distortion signals because of the inherent design of stereo playback without crosstalk cancellation. So, my point here is that the encoding of the signal is already done as part of making the recording, but we add a distortion component when we play back the encoded signal. Since we know that we've added the distortion signal, we only have to cancel it to decode the recording. That is, decoding amounts to revealing the original signal. The general idea is to remove the right signal from the left speaker output in a way that cancels the right speaker signal that shouldn't go to the left ear, and vice versa. This is more complicated than it sounds, but decoding for our purposes mainly relies on knowing what the right and left channel signals are, which of course we know. We also want to know how the listener's head and torso affects the right speaker signals differently than left speaker signals, which is why there is so much mention of head-related transfer functions. In summary, there's not some proprietary or secret encoding scheme required that must be licensed to do the proper encoding and decoding. Just a brief interruption, esteemed viewers. As you may know, I'm Tom Martin, Chief Content Officer of The Absolute Sound. We have a new product. It's on the Substack platform, and we're going to do some interesting things with Substack, first of which is reader questions and answers. Each Monday, readers will submit questions, we'll pick the most interesting ones, and we'll answer the questions on Friday. We'll also have early access to articles and special blogs that don't appear anywhere else. We hope you'll join us. It's only a cost of a cup of coffee per month. Just check on the screen or in the show notes below. Thanks, and now back to the show. The next objection is something like, if the encoding is already done, why doesn't everyone have a decoder? The problem with stereo and spatial distortion seems clear to me, but an analogy may help understand why it wasn't solved long ago. Think of, if you're familiar with vinyl, RIAA equalization that we use on LPs. To make these playable by real cartridges, the recording is equalized by reducing the bass and boosting the treble. When we play a record back, the phono stage has to boost the bass and reduce the treble. Everyone who's into vinyl knows this. 
So all phono preamps deal with it, and you don't have to think about it. If you didn't deal with it, your stereo would sound horrible with vinyl playback. Box so-called crosstalk cancellation is similar and different. It's similar in that the error term introduced by stereo reproduction in the home is a known thing, just like the RIAA error curve is a known thing. Designers mentioned above have known about interaural crosstalk for at least 40 years and have conceptually known what correction is needed. So why isn't this being addressed? The difference is that removing the error term of the RIAA EQ curve is easy, even with analog circuits that could be designed in 1958. Removing the crosstalk term in stereo reproduction is hard. So while I haven't heard them, I'm guessing that the 1980s attempts at addressing the spatial distortion issue didn't work satisfactorily well. And even if they were good, having lived through that 1980s period, these systems to reduce spatial distortion were competing with efforts to reduce all sorts of other distortions like cabinet resonances and driver distortions and amplifier distortions and D to A conversion distortions and on and on. If we say that high-end audio was born in the 1970s, basic electroacoustic scientific progress was still in its early years in high-end equipment being worked on in the 1980s. Everyone was dealing with solving those basic problems. So when crosstalk cancellation systems were introduced, they were competing with other fundamental problem solving, and they were vastly outnumbered in terms of marketing messages. Now, fast forward to 2024, and we have several decades of basic electroacoustic distortion reduction under our belts, which is wonderful. So with that progress, a product like Bach can get attention because we are in the incremental gains domain for basic signal distortions in high-end audio components. And we have 40 years of Moore's Law helping with consumer affordable computing power. So unlike Carver and Clayman and Polk, we can throw computing power, and a lot of it, at complex software so that we can address spatial distortion with big digital processing. You know this in your heart of hearts somewhere, but I find it clarifying. In 1985, the Intel 8386 was a top PC processor. It had 275,000 transistors, a rough indicator of processing power. In 2023, the Apple M2 is a top PC processor, and it has 20 billion transistors. A top modern PC has 72,000 times as many transistors. This is why we're working on computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis and autonomous vehicles now using PC processing which we were not doing in 1985. And this is probably part of why Theoretica was now able to build a version of Bach to run on a consumer computer. Another objection that people raised goes something like, most recordings are made in studios, so spatial reproduction seems irrelevant. I believe this critique starts with my tendency to describe our, meaning the Absolute Sound's musical reference, as being real musicians on real instruments in a real space. Our reviewers, as I said, call this the Absolute Sound, and that's why we named our audio magazine after the idea 50 years ago. The idea wasn't that all recordings are made in live situations in concert venues. The notion is that the idea of such music in such venues provides a useful reference for evaluating the success or failure of equipment to serve the listener well, which means that we can use the ideas of natural harmonics and dynamics and spatial reproduction to judge the virtual presentation of music that was recorded even in non-concert venues, even with physically separated musicians, even playing on different days. Lacking such a reference means its opinion all the way down. The element that makes this approach workable is the science and artistry of recording engineers. They, for the most part, are trying to present to musicians who may, as I said, be in various studio settings at various times. The idea is to present them as if they were performing in an imaginable venue at a point in time. Said another way, recording engineers work hard to create a virtual space 
and our stereo systems are attempting to reproduce this virtual space. Now, you can argue that you don't know what the virtual space that the recording engineer tried to set up was. That's literally true, but I think it sells the engineer short. Jazz quartets or rock bands or folk singers perform live all the time, and typically the engineers are trying for some similar arrangement. They aren't trying to confuse you, and they aren't trying to add quirky spatial arrangement to what the band wants. It is the case that a few bands have tried, still do try, for unusual spatial arrangements in their recordings, but this is often reflected in their live setups as well. And in my experience across thousands of recordings, mostly made in studios, these unusual alignments are rare. So judging what sounds real isn't that hard in most studio recordings. There's another issue in this question about the impossibility of judging spatial reproduction. I mentioned this before, but at times it can see as if, seem as if we are trying to create a virtual space that almost exactly mirrors the recording or the engineer's intent. If Miles Davis was right in front of and forward of Ron Carter by seven feet two inches, and he was left of and forward of Tony Williams by nine feet five inches, then it could seem that that's what we want to hear. But that sort of pedantic precision really isn't the goal. What we want is for the second great Miles Davis quartet to sound like all the players are in a real space in some believable arrangement. Whether Ron Carter sounds two feet or four feet to the left of Miles is irrelevant if it sounds as if it could be real. And anyway, we can't know what correct is because we aren't given that information whether the recording is done live or in the studio. We're aiming for a suspension of disbelief and a deeper connection to the music. Unknowable precision is a waste of time. Another objection that commenters raised is that studio engineers listened without Bach, so doesn't Bach move us farther from what the engineers wanted? I can't say for sure, but I will start with the observation that stereo with and without Bach are not completely different. If Bob Dylan was placed in between the left and right speakers by the engineer, and that's what he heard on his mastering playback system, generally, you'll hear Bob place there via Bach as well. The same holds for other placements on a standard stage. With Bach, the stage might be wider and deeper, but the musicians are basically where they were with standard stereo. And, I repeat, the main thing with Bach is not macro performer placement. It is opening up the air around the performers, increasing the resolution of them and their instruments, and creating a better sense of the performance space. Ideally, this always happens, but there are times when things get wonky, though such cases are rare. In my earlier review, I mentioned Dave Brubeck's famous Time Out album. Some of the quartet is placed left rear and right rear with Bach, which isn't what you hear in normal stereo. And I think the Bach rendition is less true to what the engineers heard and wanted. I'm guessing, but in this case, I wish they had had Bach to hear the full impact of their mastering work. I don't think this would have made the standard stereo version worse, by the way. Engineers seem to have moved on from this strange, this was 1958, set of effects from the early stereo days, fortunately. And for those early recordings, you can turn off Bach processing with the press of a button. It is worth noting that I also don't know if engineers have preamps and amps and speakers that are as good as my reference system. And I don't know that they have their reference system set up the same way mine is set up. But if they don't, and they probably don't, this doesn't seem to greatly hamper their ability to do some wonderful mixes. And I'm not sure if bad mixes are bad because the engineers don't have a rig like mine set up like mine. I might balance some recordings differently, of course. With Bach, it is mostly the same. They don't have Bach, and as a result, I might might want to place performers a bit differently to optimize the results, but this is no different than the frequency balance difference between studios and my or your system. In fact, because of the imaging precision, I think, non-issue that I covered before, it might even be less of an issue than the frequency and resolution differences between mastering and home systems. After all, a Steinway D has a characteristic spectral balance that I'm familiar with, as does a Martin D28. 
the imagined spatial layout of recording isn't so obviously right and wrong if our point of judgment is, does it sound like it could have been real? So you could argue that the spectral and time domain variations between studio and, studio and home systems are a bigger problem than the spatial thing that we're talking about with Bach and the difference between engineers listening or not listening on Bach. I should add that mastering is done on systems that have, as a minimum, different polar radiation patterns than my system or your system, and they are done in rooms with different dimensions and acoustic treatments, and these mastering systems differ from one another. So we have a recording versus playback system problem anyway. That error may be bigger than any error introduced by Bach. My assessment is that Bach better reveals what the engineers intended 80% of the time when judged on whether it sounds lifelike. The other 20% of the time, it is either about the same or interestingly worse. In the end, I'd want better mastering playback systems and I'd want them to include Bach. But I don't think this is necessary for good results with Bach. Another objection raised is that this, meaning Bach, is just like making speaker-based audio into a large pair of headphones. Well, no, but I grant that the reasons are not obvious. Headphones do indeed keep the right channel information from making it to the left ear and vice versa. So the similarity noted here is real. And headphones can sound more clear and resolving than standard speaker-based stereo. But headphones usually place images either inside your head and or just outside your head to the left and the right. Linkwitz, in the Proceedings of the Institute of Acoustics, says, for example, that with headphones, typically sounds in the frontal direction are perceived as originating inside one's head. And he adds that dis distances with headphones are perceived as foreshortened, meaning quite close to you, even if outside your head. I've reviewed many headphones, and they all have some version of these issues. Speaker-based listening with Bach is not at all like this. With the sound stage with Bach appearing to be larger than the room, the opposite of foreshortened, and seeming to be completely outside of your head, with performers generally in realistic positions in about a 90 degree arc to the front. Headphones, it turns out, need to meet three criteria to present a head externalized sound space. The signal must be adjusted for the spectral cues of the HRTF of the listener. The spectral cues due to the HRTF must be adjusted for the angle of the listener's head in the XY plane. The headphones must be equalized to compensate for the acoustic coupling of the transducers to the ears of the listener. If this is not done, the spectral cues from point number one are degraded, especially with closed back headphones. Headphones without processing do not meet these criteria, which is why Bach used with speakers, which does meet the different criteria for head externalized and source independent imaging from speakers, does not sound at all like standard headphones. There is, by the way, a version of Bach called Bach HP, HP stands for headphones, to address the issues I just described with headphone listening and imaging. These points are related to empirical knowledge of how the ear brain system is set up to perceive locations of sounds. The ear brain is very good at this because our genes survived from a time on the savannah when we had to be good at knowing where the lion was. This hearing system is also very good at discriminating real from artificial spatial cues, which is why the scientists who have worked on virtual spatial reproduction seem to harp endlessly about not sending cues to the ear brain that signal where the sound sources are. I raise this point as a caution about trying to reason too exactly about all of this. The ear and the brain processing of auditory signals is enormously complex. Scientists who study this system confess that its mechanics and biology and conscious impact are not completely understood. So in the end, some of this is relegated to empirical findings of cause and effect. I alluded to the criterion that Bach has to meet to do its job with speakers. It is the criterion mentioned earlier. The interoral crosstalk must be canceled 
or the result is that your ear brain can locate the speakers and virtually present too much of the image there. Interestingly, Bach does significant crosstalk cancellation, but the reflections in a real listening room, even with treatments, also help keep the virtual image away from your head by limiting crosstalk cancellation to less than 100%, which of course doesn't happen with headphone listening in unprocessed form. The next objection or objections was something like, this is crap, straight insanity, you're confused. I have a PhD in electronic engineering. Well, perhaps we should start with the possibility that I am confused. Maybe I didn't hear what I heard. Maybe listening to hundreds of high-end rigs and components per year has muddled rather than informed my perspective. So don't take my word for it. I strongly suggest that you listen to Bach at a show or buy the introductory version to test for yourself. I do note that the insanity crap comments almost never come with any critique of the logic I'm presenting. This makes it hard for me to be helpful to the community, so my apologies if I don't understand the critique and there's some merit behind it. In a closing effort to be helpful, I will say that when talking to audiophiles, I sometimes feel that the electronic signal purity model, which the absolute sound may have unwittingly encouraged in bygone years, is a model with limits. Getting a pure signal from recording medium to speaker output is good, but not enough. A model which includes the room and the ear brain system and the way that the system works is critical to progress in musical appreciation. I was thrilled that Bach seems to have helped us move down this path. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please click on the subscribe button and the notification bell. Also check the show notes for the link to sign up to our free weekly newsletter. And we would love it if you'd subscribe to the Absolute Sound magazine in print or digital form. As I mentioned, we've been publishing it for over 50 years and it has some of our top reviewers work inside. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you.